Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next guest is Alexander Hinton. He's a professor at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. And we are going to talk about Cambodia. We're going to talk about the banality of uh, evil and about human rights and about this idea of, of, of being open and being open to others and being open to, to an ethical understanding of, of others and, and what it means to, to, to be ignorant or, or as a Buddhist and to read the eyes. Um, the book is Man or Monster, The Trial of a Khmer Rouge uh, Torturer. Fascinating uh, uh, interview uh, with Alex. And this is part one. Uh, we are going to be doing a part two and we even talk about the possibility of talking about forgiveness in part two. So I hope you uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, this is case 001. I hope I've piqued your interest with Alexander Hinton. And don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about uh, my public speaking and my writing and 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 for more podcasts and also rabble.ca you can find them there coming right up uh, alexander hinton uh, talking about his latest book man or monster well welcome to face to face uh we are joined by i, I can tell you how excited i am today i am in newark new jersey i'm actually not excited about that <laughs> but uh, i am excited uh, to be here with uh, professor alexander hinton at the center for study of genocide and human rights and i understand that uh, conflict resolution used to be in the title uh, so i'm hoping you haven't taken it out of the program but just That's out of the title uh, uh, in, professor hinton but uh, conflict resolution is implicit in <laughs> genocide right. and human rights so but of it was course. name was getting a bit how, long how so. could it be otherwise yeah. yeah i'd like to see the acronym uh, acronym for that that would be uh, it would be hard to get on a button it was hard so cghr yeah. is what we say but it was cg and then it got hard for people because of like C G C R H R. It was too much. That's uh, that's funny. Um, so I at uh, one time had an idea for an organization called the Center for Global Advocacy, and the acronym, of course, is CGA, which is Certified General Accountant. So as soon as I figured yeah, that out, we had to we had yeah, to toss had, that had to out toss the door. It out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the world of acronyms. So so we have chatted before. Thank you again for being yeah, a guest and face to face. And 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 uh, I can't believe we're here. We're here for a variety of reasons. So thank you for 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 your, for your time. We're here to talk about your new book, though, um, Man or Monster: The Trial of a Khmer Rouge Torturer. It's quite a subtitle. It's quite a title. Can you That's can you kind of bring us into this a little bit? Maybe a tiny bit of the history. I mean, this has been a part of your life since late nineties. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my sort of interests go back to when I was a graduate student. I did field work in Cambodia uh, in the mid nineteen nineties, uh, and that resulted in a book, "Why Did They Kill Cambodia in the Shadow of Genocide." Um, and which so, we talked about. Which on our we last. talked about previously, exactly. Um, so my most recent project has been looking at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, officially the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, but everybody just calls it the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Um, and I've done you know a fair amount of research, uh, but as an anthropologist, my original research, uh, which informs this book as well, uh, but it was going to be on you know how do you translate the idea of justice, of global justice, in a radically different cultural context. Uh, and I certainly can, gathered a lot of information. In fact, I've just completed a book manuscript on that topic. Hmm. Uh, but I arrived to do my field work, uh, you know, for the first trial that got going, which was uh, case 001, as they say, the trial hmm. of Doik, uh, who was the commandant of S21, a secret uh, prison security center where maybe 15 to 20,000 people were incarcerated. Some of them were killed right away. Many more were tortured. Uh, interrogated, uh, they confessed, and at that point they would be killed. So virtually everyone who went there uh, And S21 died. Is, uh, it has become now kind of an icon for uh, tourism in some regards, but also for genocide and for, for the Khmer Rouge in a sense. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite the, uh, the symbol of what the regime was really all about. Yeah, absolutely. And actually this book, um, you know, I'll just circle back to that in just one moment. So this book, though, once I went to this trial with this figure, Doik, who ran S21, 
Uh, I sometimes think of it as he sort of hijacked my project, and hmm. I knew I had to write about him. Uh, there were just so many different issues that were at play, one of which, of course, as the title says, is as headlined in the newspapers at the start of his trial, Comrade Doik, quote unquote, man or monster. And actually, that is part of the generation of the title. Um, you know, I can talk about the cover of the book, which picks up on this, but it's really the hinge that opens up the book. Uh, you know, some people have titles that are informational. This one is meant to provoke thought from the get-go and also to say something very central to what the book is about. Um, but the book actually doesn't begin with this trial. It does discuss it a little bit in the first chapter, but it goes to Tool Slang, which is the genocide museum that was opened uh, at S21 afterwards. Uh, and there's a photo there that I stumbled across uh, right as his trial began. Uh, which had, is now the cover Which is the, the cover. It yep. had been defaced. Fascinating. Yep. Yeah. And so book at this point was not really on the table. Sorry for that. You, really, you weren't working on this. The photo proceeded. Yeah, the photo was there, but I knew, kind of, I said, at the time, I said, that's an image. You know, I took a picture of it. Every time I went back, I'd take another picture of it. Hmm. But what was also fascinating is that it changed. Hmm. So people would continue to graffiti. They would, take the, they would take it down, replace it with another one, and they would graffiti again. So, oh, I have so, you, so you actually, you saw a, sort of an evolution of this photograph. Absolutely. Uh, shifting over time and different types yeah. of graffiti. And, exactly. the, and, 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 and the graffiti, in a sense, was almost people's responses. And, and that's, trying to answer that man or monster question, in a sense, in one word. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where the cover comes from. So in other words, uh, the title gets to this question, and you know, in U.S. political discourse, we've seen it with uh, people labeling President Trump a monster sociopath, uh, so on and so forth. This language is circulated. There was uh, an op-ed that came out on the day of the inauguration saying, so now a monster is president. Right. So, you know, it's been, and there's, well, as a small aside, you know, I, I've gone to some of the demonstrations, and there's a, some artists have created a image of of President Trump, and they've colored in his eyes in red, and it looks demonic. And actually, right. the, of course the photo of Doik, right, the eyes yes. are scribbled. Yeah. And for people with a Western lens from a Judeo-Christian tradition who look at it, they think of a demon, of a monster, of the devil in this way. But part of the reason I chose this is I actually talks to Cambodians about what they see when they see it. There's Khmer script in English, I should add, and the word evil is written across the collar on Doik's uh, shirt in the photo. But the Cambodian writing is actually Buddhist often, and people read the eyes, which people will often say in a Judeo-Christian tradition, will say, oh, it's the devil, it's a demon. In Cambodian perspective, it's a, many people read it as a sign of ignorance, Buddhist ignorance. So even if you then go to the word evil, you can't really translate that word in Khmer. You can say an extreme sin, but people will talk about his actions not as something, you know, he's an evil person, he did it because he's evil, which is more of a theological, philosophical lens. They'll talk about it in terms of Buddhist sin. And of course, the, if you talk about the vices in Buddhism, one of them is blindness. And so again, in terms of readings, people will come in and see the image and read things in absolutely different ways. And it's also, as you said, uh, we're often doing this in a very reductive form because it's the way the human mind works. And that's something, uh, is another theme in the book that I try and throw into question, uh, is you know, what are we constantly erasing are, and redacting? What are we not seeing? Absolutely. Isn't, isn't that really? Uh, it's, and the paradox is we're always not right. seeing something. We're always editing. We're always uh, generating reductive articulations of the other. It happens all the time. And what's really hard is to step back, accept that this is the way we think, and have a willingness to open up to other perspectives, to that which we don't know. And ultimately, that which is different, that which we doesn't know, tends to be scary to you people. You used the phrase global justice in a different context in relation to trial 001, case 001, right a few minutes ago at the beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Context seems to be very much not only a theme for this where I mean, you're an anthropologist, for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. So talk, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, the eyes, uh, the eyes for me, uh, um, you know, scratched out or one thing, the eyes scratched out for a Cambodian or something else. Mm -hmm we don't usually take that with us. Yeah. And so when I walk into a museum or into a school setting or whatever the case might be with my mm -hmm. friends or my wife or my kids or, or whatever, my professor, what aren't we seeing? Well, in some <laughs> right? sense, we're you seeing know, what we want to see, right? what okay. we're preconditioned to see, mm -hmm. uh, what's taken for granted, what's naturalized. And you know, part of critical thought, uh, which people talk about, but in fact, you know, if you start pressing people about it, people often don't have a very sort of deep sense for what it is and a way to explicate it. 
But if you're really talking about critical thought, it's the ability to constantly be questioning those structures that are taken for granted, that are naturalized, and begin to unpack them. And again, this is something that you know a lot of people say, well, critical thinking is a good thing. But ultimately, critical thinking is a scary thing hmm. because the very ways we think about the world are ultimately, through this action, being destabilized. Uh, and if we were, again, going back to some other themes about violence, the origins of genocide, there's certainly many factors. Economic factors are critical. Uh, social dynamics are critical. But also, on a certain level, the sort of notion of the need to believe right. is something that's absolutely critical. We need to believe in something, and having our fundamental beliefs upended are scary. And so sometimes in situations of upheaval, those structures of belief become all the more compelling. So it's interesting. So for, for Cambodian, uh, the scratched out eyes could potentially mean Buddhist ignorance. Um, you're suggesting in the book and in your work and your writing and so on, we need to go deeper. So there's clearly a connection there. There's clearly a parallel. Was that evident to you right out of the gate when, when, when you started the project, yeah. that there was that connection? Yeah. Was it very well, intentional? So I, I should say, you know, maybe it was a, a silly thing, but you know, I always said I have to wait for the trial to end, right. and then I will write the book. Uh, there was a journalist who wrote a very interesting book about Doik, uh, but he was, I think, writing the whole time. So his book was done pretty much right afterwards. Uh, but I really wanted to sort of sit with it, to look at the trial, to go back and review manuscripts. And just to be clear, the trial is 100% done, nothing else happening, yeah. or this, this trial. Right, so the trial of Doik is yeah, finished. Is finished. But what I learned is uh, people always say, oh, it's going to start in three months, and it took like two or three years. Oh, I see. And these right. take forever. So right. Right. the trial, you know, he was arrested uh, back in 2007, uh, and then his trial began in 2009. I uh, got a verdict the following year, and the final judgment was in 2012. So it takes a really long time. So I started writing the book in 2012, uh, and it was at that point when it began to emerge. So it wasn't as if I had a preconceived framework, but it was it just emerged from being there, from looking through the transcripts, having that photo, which actually I was uh, at Princeton, at the Institute for Advanced Study at the time, and I put up photos of mm -hmm. Doik mm -hmm. on my door, mm -hmm. and I knew that that was going to be something that was important, and this notion of the, you know, our sets of understandings that are circulating, how do we read something, what are we continually missing, uh, you know, that structure, uh, that idea became absolutely central, and then there was this whole issue of how to write it. And I also felt that the thing I was writing about needed not to be written in a way that did exactly what I was trying to destabilize, which is right. to write a straightforward expository right. uh, analysis that tells you as the reader what to think. Well, it didn't take long to realize that, that something else was going on when I started to read the book uh, within a couple of pages that, that, you know, as you say, I think at one point near the end of the beginning, you, how you situ you've situated yourself within this in a, in a much more explicit manner, mm -hmm. almost theatrically, almost narratively as a device. But then you talk about poetry, you talk about ethnography, and so on, and how, and, and something kind of new for me. And so I would love to talk a little bit about that, and then, and then how that connects to, you know, frames, which, you know, we're, of course, we're back, we're, we're back to where we, were, where we started with this idea of perspective and context and so on. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah, the, you know, so it's supposed to begin with the cover. The cover, as I found it, was uncanny. So the notion of the uncanny runs throughout the, uh, throughout the text. Uh, but it's supposed to be a destabilizing image. And so really it's the cover where those strategies are employed. Uh, again, you know, I don't know what most people do when they get cover images, uh, when they have titles, uh, but these were absolutely critical to me. The title of the book, um, they're sort of a long story, but uh, let's just say I ended up uh, with the publisher uh, who published it because they liked the title, and that was important to me. Um, you know, if you open up to the table of contents, you have a series of one-word titles, mm. all of which are actually different ways of articulating Doik, ways of talking about him that emerge. If you turn to the next thing in the book... Villain, zealot, scapegoat, the accused. Yeah, so, and so, so these things are... And, you know, you go to the next thing, the accused fact sheet, public version redacted. So if you see the word redacted, again, which is one of the thematics in the book, it's written in that as well, that again, it's an articulation of things. And in fact, I'm taking and editing out of the official document about the trial. Uh, and so it goes on, so on and so forth. So these, you know, it's there very much from the beginning. Uh, and I'm trying not to tell the reader what to think, 
but to talk about how to think. So in other words, it's not delivering a message that Doik is an evil person. Right. It's why do we think about people like Doik as evil, and what does that say about how we think? In a sense, the book ultimately is about critical thinking, about the ways we see the world, and how potentially within that we can get an ethical stance. So, so in a sense, you're almost, you're almost not taking a position in a, in a sense uh, because you want me to, to unpack this. You want me to go a little deeper with this. You want me to do more research. You want me to engage others around these, these same questions, which is back to this whole idea of you know, ignorance and, and so on, mm -hmm. Buddhist ignorance and so on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, my goal is to have the reader think, to have the reader go on a journey that hopefully provokes critical thinking, uh, to have the reader go on a journey that hopefully provokes an unpacking of implicit assumptions. Yeah, typically, Alex, I'm coming to you because you're the expert, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, I don't, just tell me what's going on with Doik and with S21 and Cambodia, right? Yeah. And so this is, so, so, you're, so, so, so there's a bigger project here then as well. Right? This isn't just about Dyke. This isn't just about genocide. Oh, this absolutely. isn't about evil. This isn't about reconciliation. It's all those things. It's all those things. And more. And more. And it's how we think about them. It's ultimately very much a book, as I've said, about thinking. And this is where the inspiration uh, from Hannah Arendt comes from, because that's ultimately what she was. Right. The banality, banality of evil. Banality of evil and thinking. What is critical thinking? Which you kind of turn on its head, in a sense. Right? I do. I mean, again, she, the phrase banality of evil was something in Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, that appears. There are a couple of references to the idea in terms of Kant. Um, but really, she said very little about what she meant by that concept. She returned to it a little bit later. Uh, but she talks about it, for example, as thoughtlessness. Right. Um, and for her, I think as well, it was the lack of a capacity for critical thinking that led Eichmann to do what he did. And for her, that's ultimately current. I think for critical theory in general, Frankfurt School, it's the ability to think critically about things. And it goes back to enlightenment thought to Kant. But for me, absolutely, I'm, you know, I'm with that project, I agree. But there's something that is left out because in fact, the way we think itself, it's not just thoughtlessness, it's thoughtfulness. Because the way we're inclined to think and understand the world ultimately is one that requires constant critical thinking. So it's not that he was thoughtless, he was thoughtful. He thought in, these redu in the reductive manner that all of us do, such as when we use words like man or monster. Right. The number of times right. you see the word savage, barbarian, uh, monster that appear in the media uh, used by presidents of countries, uh, depictions of ISIS, constantly takes place. And, there's an important stake in this. There's something at stake, which is understanding. How so, are we going to understand ISIS if we simply call them evil, barbaric, or savage? That's a non-answer. And is that, a, is that a way to, I'm going to read a quote here from a second from, okay. from the book, but so that, is that a way just to compartmentalize really in, in, from your perspective? I mean, is that about having not to really think about it further? Because if we label them that, if we can put them on the shelf and say, oh, barbarian, savage, monster, mm -hmm. we can kind of move on yeah. in a way? Yeah, absolutely. But this is the sort of paradox, yeah. is that as human beings, we have to think this way. Mm -hmm. This is the way that human beings think, because we can't take into account the enormous amount of information. There's no way to take that. You would go insane. We think in categorical terms or through metaphor. Right? We reduce reality into certain sorts of frames that we can order what the social milieu, the universe through which we're moving. We have to order it in some way. The problem is that the way we order it ultimately involves redacting, reducing, sure. shrinking, and it ends up with the potential to help us navigate very difficult situations. Right? It's evolutionarily, it's something that's adaptive, but the danger is that it creates a proneness towards reductive ways of thinking of other groups. And if you think about the stranger, many different manifestations, there's constantly a fear of that. And also in terms of, you know, I've sort of moved into a, uh, you know, a register of talking about evolution or adaptation, but it's adaptive to think this way, to have your structures of belief that order your universe because that's how you're able to survive. So are you okay with an ordered universe? You just want me to put it in check every now and then? You're okay with a bit of redaction? You're okay with it? Or the redaction's inevitable. It's inevitable. This Absolutely. Is a part of it's the way it is. It's just the way it is, but for crying out loud, 
let things bubble to the surface from time to time. Check the footnotes once in a while. Ask another question. Yeah, so I would say if people, most people, all of us, live much of our lives uh, with things that are taken for granted, naturalized. Right. It's the right. way we're able to even have this conversation right, right now. Right? There's my all sorts of information. My software. Exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, we would go insane, I'd literally. Go sockless. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we're, in this sense, right? Yeah. We're thoughtful beings, but there's all sorts of stuff that we're constantly redacting. Sure. The ability to think critically about it is to try and step back and ask, what am I missing? What am I leaving out? And to have an openness to that which is different. And again, this notion mm. of that which is different, that which has been left out, there's a stake to having it be ordered. And it's, it makes you uncomfortable. So going back to the cover of the book, the image of Doik, it makes me uncomfortable. Most people see that image it's and a find it. It's a disturbing di image. Disturbing. It's and a it's disturbing. And it's yeah. meant to be that way. To me, writing about Doik was something that was unsettling okay. in the same way. It's not as if I'm somehow have stepped out of the universe of Doik and I'm writing in a distance way. No, I'm presenting articulations of him. I'm redacting as I do it. And I'm unsettled through the writing process. Yeah, the last word in the book is haunting and haunted. I have, so I have so many questions. I mean, I want to I want to I want to pull this back into the whole notion of uncanny. But can I just can I just read this here uh, quote? In this sense, the failure to think is a constant challenge, an inevitable part of the everyday ways we think about, frame, and articulate the world. As we think, then there is a need to critically ref reflect about how we are framing, including framings suggesting interpretations of self and others. So you said an openness just moments ago to that which mm -hmm. is different. Mm -hmm. Is that also another layer to this? That there is a a desire as an anthropologist, as a as a as a, uh, a husband, as a human being, as a scholar, to embrace, to include. Absolutely. Kind well, of yeah. I mean, again, it's a frame. It's an articulation. It's a stance to the world. But in terms of our ethical bearings, we all have to make decisions about ethical being in the world. And the ethics I'm arguing for ultimately is one of openness. Uh, so at the end of the book. Um, I talk about conviction, but also about effacing others, like the word effacement, which is in French is widely used. It's less used in English, but it means effacer, to rub out. And so again, we're constantly, in a sense, effacing, and in genocide, it's taken to the extreme. And I argue at the end for an ethical stance of this archaic word in English uh, called to efface something, to efface, effacement. And again, it's interesting, we don't really have a word that's the opposite of to efface. If you look at the dictionary, you look at the source, you don't find it. The closest thing I found was the notion of effacement, mm. uh, which is an obsolete English word. And so at the end of the book, I come back and argue for this ethical stance of effacement, which is ultimately a difficult thing to do. Who wants to be uncomfortable? Right. We all want to be comfortable. Critical thinking ultimately is something that makes, should make everyone deeply uncomfortable. Uh, and it's sort of facing up to that. And with, our, with the idea of becoming more comfortable with those notions? Or? No, I think once you, the journey of critical thinking, uh, depending on the extent to which it's taken, is one that should be uncomfortable and is uncomfortable. And people do it to different degrees. Uh, and hopefully in colleges and universities, people are learning how to critically think. I certainly use that as the basis of all my pedagogy. Uh, you know, but hopefully that's what it's you come out with, and then you we, use it in life. We've, as you we've talked very little about Doik, about the trial, uh, trials, and so on. That's Isn't like, it interesting? It's, yeah. it's just well, fascinating, it's, and that's yeah. going to be part two. Um, is there a sense in which that Cambodians, and I've certainly heard this in my own uh, travel and so on, there seems to be a, a large percentage of the people that I meet in Cambodia throughout the country who just want this all to go away? Well, it's is, a that a, is that a different? That's just we're, now we're talking about memory. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about reconciliation, we're talking about pain, we're talking about trauma, and so many other things. Is there a connection to this will unwillingness to think, this Buddhist ignorance, in a yeah. sense? That Cambodians just go, listen, I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's done. It's in the past. Yeah, I mean, so that's a very complicated uh, it's situation. It's ridiculous, and, right? And yeah. to characterize everybody in one manner is right. difficult, and so you can talk about uh, ways of thinking about it, perhaps, which right. is a way to do it. Uh, some people, in terms of Buddhism, say, you know, you need to not hang on to the past, to your attachments. That itself will lead to problematic reincarnations. It's a form of attachment in the world. So let go of it. Be released. Let go right. of your anger. Uh, and with people, so some people will say, with Doik, for example, uh, you know, he's already sinned. 
he's going to suffer the karmic fate of his act consequences of his action. Right. So in that sense, some might say there's no point in having a tribunal. Right. On the other hand, I've spoken to monks who say Buddhism uh, puts a great emphasis on right thought, clear thought, being able to do analysis to discern right and wrong. So having a trial take place ultimately enables people to better distinguish between right and wrong, and so there's a point to it. Yeah, so, I mean, it kind so of... So there are a variety of attitudes, and it's even within Buddhism, like all religions, right, has all sorts of different ways of looking at sure, the world within sure. it. There's not a, a single... I don't, I don't know how a country... I don't know how anyone really comes to terms with anything without critically reflecting. Without, to me, critical reflection has to, you know, engage. It has to. There's conversation. There's dialogue. There's relationships. There's community around cr critical. Ref you don't typically critically reflect on your own. You can, I suppose, but I think some of the best happens dialogically in in in, in a community. Well, that's what um, a philosopher does, right? Yes, and, indeed. And indeed. ideally, everyone does, but certainly. Uh, well, I, I was just going to say, if you go back to the notion of critical thought, a lot of people will point to Plato, to Socrates, though ultimately that's kind of a monologic dialogue, right, right with column response, and so there is critical thinking, it but is. it's yeah. it's yeah. like a lecture. Yes. Uh, so even that it was a good a model. model. It was a good model, yes. and it provokes it thought a, and the and it, write, and it reads pretty well, but a little contrived, reads, sadly. Yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. and it's all, I'm not going to say philosopher king is dictatorial, but certainly there's oh, a yes. there's a right answer with that. Uh, but that's maybe a different uh, different discussion. That's but I but I would I would say that almost all of our lives are lived without thinking critically. Wow, wow. That's and I think it's statement. actually yeah. You know, yeah. depending on your orientation because we categorize because we the need because to survive to absolutely. get along to build communities to be so, happy to be happy yeah to happens. have well I think happy is a set of beliefs to act in accordance with those beliefs yeah, yeah. to have an ordered reality in some sense uh, I mean but you can be suffering can, and happiness that's another huge yeah, it discussion is. I was just right? gonna say but hang on you can be happy and still think critically yeah but I think it you can be but I think it destabilizes <laughs> a lot of the structures that would lead people to, in some sense to be happy or have a sense of satisfaction right. because it's ultimately very destabilizing so, I think it's I think it's it can lead to happiness as, as an endeavor. It can lead to insight, which can lead to a sort of happiness, uh, but it also can be deeply destabilizing. And I think it can be scary. I think it's difficult ultimately. You're not selling me on critical reflection here, uh, Professor Hinton. Well, yeah, I, uh, well, it's hard to do and it's, <laughs> it's difficult and, you know, but ultimately without it, yeah. uh, as we look in the media, as I just provided a few yeah. little examples, yeah. these characterizations are circulating all over the place. So wow. we go back to Doik the monster, Donald Trump, right. President Trump the monster, right. ISIS, the savages, the primitives. Yeah. Yeah. What do we understand by saying yeah. ISIS, yeah. they're a bunch of savages? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, we not see a reflection of ourselves. So just because we have to wrap this up, and we are going to, by the way, do a part two. We're going to come back to uh, Man or Monster, the trial of a Khmer Rouge uh, torture by Alexander Hinton. But I'd, I'd like to just close and bring it back sort of to the trial and, and, and someone who's probably a friend of yours and I've met at, at S21, Bu Meng, uh, who's written a book and uh, has quite an experience, one of the survivors from mm -hmm. S21, invoking a, quote, invoking a Cambodian saying, Bu Meng added, it's not possible, this is Bu Meng speaking now, quote, it's not possible to cleanse white paper that has been stained with black, mm -hmm. close quote, a Khmer yeah. saying of a sort I was unfamiliar with. Way too big of a question to ask as we wrap up, but I'm leaning, I'm looking. Where does forgiveness come into play? Where does grace come into play? Where does the other come into play here? Mm -hmm. And and if if Bu Meng is right, mm -hmm. there really may maybe there really isn't uh, a, 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 a good end to this story. Yeah. So sometimes I think it's good to end with a question. Good. Uh, but having said that, <laughs> but maybe not. Uh, the book I've been working on, yeah. uh, you know, this book takes up those issues to a degree, but really this book manuscript I've just completed takes it up to a much greater extent. I'm happy to quickly respond yeah, to it, please. or we yeah. can end with no, a go, question. No, go. Yeah. Well, okay. So again, how did the victims respond to Doik? Uh, at the very beginning, he asked for forgiveness. He apologized. Wow. Uh, so this was a big moment. Uh, on the flip side, there was an incredible amount of evidence uh, incriminating him. So in a way, everyone knew he was guilty. He admitted his and we're guilt. we're talking about horrific crimes. Yeah, but there's documentation, horrific crimes. There's documentation, mm -hmm. piles mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of sheets of documentation. Uh, he would never, it was an impossibility for him to ever 
be found not guilty in a right. sense. There's right. just too much evidence. Right. He knew it. Everybody knew it. Uh, so in that situation, he said, I'm, I'm sorry. He, I should note he converted uh, to Christianity. Uh, and this that. was a sort of strand that existed in his testimony. He carried a Bible sometimes. Uh, of course, in Christianity, you can wash away your sin, whereas in Buddhism, you can't. Right. Uh, and so a lot of former Khmer Rouge, a number of them have converted to evangelical Christianity. Uh, so it's sort of another storyline. But yeah. so whatever he did, and I don't have an answer for you about his motives, I open it up as I do the title, Man or Monster. He apologized. Some people said he did it because, you know, what else could he do? What there was too much do? evidence. Uh, he said that he wanted to tell the truth so people could find out what happened. As the trial got going, uh, you know, some civil parties uh, said, well, okay, if he does this, perhaps we can move in some sense towards something like forgiveness. Now, again, what does forgiveness mean becomes a question. What does it mean in the context of Cambodia? And again, you have notions of Christianity versus Buddhism. It's big, big questions. Sure. We'll sort of bracket that into sure, our future sure, conversation. Sure. Um, but for the moment, we'll, let's say most of the civil parties uh, who were there came to the conclusion that Doik would only tell uh, what he needed to tell. Mm. Uh, and he was doing this basically to have a reduction in his sentence. Uh, right. There are some events that take place. Again, I won't say what happens at the end because hopefully it's a drama and people will want to read and find sure, out sure. what happens to him at the end. But there were events that occurred that led people to be even, towards the end of his trial, that led people to be even more suspect about him. Uh, some people, though, uh, some of the civil party said, I'm a Buddhist. Uh, he has sinned. He is, you know, Buddhist sin, right? He will suffer the consequences of these actions when he's reborn. Uh, so forgive, he's a human being, you know, so in that sense, uh, I forgive him, though again, it's not a sort of Christian forgiveness. Right, right. But it's more, you know, I don't hold anything against him. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. Let's he's move a on. human being like all of us. He's ignorant, <clears throat> and he's going to suffer the consequences of the actions. So some people said that. Others turned to him when they were given the chance to speak in court and said, uh, I've sat here and listened to you. You have not told the truth. Given the enormity of your crimes, the fact that I think you're still lying, you have crocodile tears, uh, you show no, none of the nonverbal sort of emotive aspects of apology, there's no way in the world I could ever forgive you. Right, right. And I think most of the civil parties broke in that direction. Almost all of them, wow. I would say. Not wow. all of them, but the ones who didn't, some of them said, I'm Buddhist and I still feel this way. Right. Uh, so what's the possibility of forgiveness? Sometimes, um, you know, why? Well, it's sort of, again, goes to the second book and different yeah, sure. conversations. But, you know, what does it mean that we ask a victim to forgive a perpetrator or a perpetrator asks for forgiveness? Okay, I forgive you. Okay, great. I'm going to go live my life. Is that satisfactory? In some right. sense, there's this thing like, oh, it's great. Everybody went. There was an apology. There was forgiveness. You know, everything was happy. You know, people lived their lives happily ever after. Is that a reasonable expectation to have someone... Uh, to think they're going to do this at, at a trial at a given moment, given all of the suffering and how much their lives have been ruined? I don't know. And I think it varies for each person, each person's life. They make decisions. I think it's possible some people, uh, some victims might forgive Doik, and three years later, maybe they don't forgive him. It, it's just not clear cut. So again, this emphasis on apology and forgiveness is, again, a very reductive way of thinking right. about human right. beings right. in the end. Um, so maybe well, with it's the, kind of nice you've, you've, you've kind of ended with a question. That's, so, I always like to end with a question. <laughs> one go. that hopefully is the last word of, word of the book says will, will be a haunting one. Man or Monster, <laughs> the trial of a Khmer Rouge uh, torturer, Professor Alexander Hinton, uh, at the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutger University. It's uh, a, a real pleasure, and we are going to do a part two. Sounds I hope great. that's okay. Uh, maybe yeah. we'll book it the Thank day you before, very much. before sounds, I leave sounds, today. But really, great. we barely scratched the surface. Thanks so much for your time yeah. today. Thank you. Thank you.